King Cardenshire, Dunatar Castle. In Scots Gaelic, Dun Ear, Fort on the Shelving Slope. St. Ninian is said to have founded a church here in the 5th century, but it's unclear when the first fortified castle was built on the site. The earliest written reference to any fortification is found in the Annals of Ulster which mentions two sieges of Dun Ear in 681 and 694. The site had been the focus of attack through the centuries, including a siege in 681 and 694, as well as a battle between King Donald II and the Vikings in 900. It's believed that King Ethelstan targeted the fort in 934. It was fought over between Edward I and William Wallace, who burned down the church and the entire English garrison within. It was the last holdout for Charles II against Cromwell in 1652 and was the hiding place for the honors of Scotland, the crown jewels. Dunatar was eventually forfeit to the crown and dismantled in the 1720s after coming into the possession of the Earl Marischal. Words cannot describe this impressive castle on its cliff over the sea. It is practically the definition of the word impregnable. Do be prepared for a long, uphill half-mile walk, though, but it is well worth the long hike. There is a second entrance for the more intrepid explorers, from the rocky creek and cave on the north side, with a steep path up the cliff. The medieval fortress dates from about the 15th century and played a prominent role through much of Scottish history. The castle is spread over three and a half acres and has only a narrow strip of land to connect it to the mainland. Federesso Castle. This is a 14th century tower house built in the Scottish Gothic style by the Earl's Marischal of Dunatar, though there is evidence of prehistoric use of the site, as well as medieval. There is a cursus, a series of parallel lengths of banks with external ditches which were originally thought to be early Roman athletic courses, though this is unproven, the Latin name cursus, means course. The most ancient part of the site includes a Bronze Age cairn with human remains inside. This was also a Bronze Age site called Malcolm's Mount, legend says Malcolm I was buried here, as he was slain in Federasso in 954 CE. More legends recount Jean Hunter, a woman that lived in the castle in 1659. She was accused of witchcraft and hanged at her own home. The castle is just west of Stonehaven, and therefore easily visited in conjunction with Dunatar, listed above. Nine Stained Stone Circle At this site, you get three for one. There are three stone circles in the small area, just southwest of Bantry. Two of the circles, known as Elsie the Greater and Elsie the Lesser, are within sight of each other, standing just a half a mile apart. The third site, Nine Stains, forms a rough triangle in location, but is blocked from view by a stand of trees. The sites are very much reclaimed by nature, the stones are covered in lichen, the forest is close, one of the horizontal stones is now fallen, but this is still a must-see for stone circle enthusiasts. Kinrossshire Loch Laven Castle an important part of Scotland's history for over 300 years, this castle was probably best known as the prison of Mary Queen of Scots during 1567 to 1568. It was here that she was forced by the powerful Scottish barons to abdicate her throne in favor of her son, James VI, still an infant. In order to reach the castle, you take a ferry across the loch to the island castle. Within the curtain wall of the castle, there is a very early tower house from the 1300s, with wonderful, vaulted ceilings still intact for the kitchens. The present castle dates to about the 1300s and may have been built by Edward I. Certainly the English troops were there when it was captured by William Wallace in the dead of night. The modern incarnation likely replaced an earlier Pictish fort from about 490 CE. Loch Laven Heritage Trail. This walking trail runs over seven miles around the north side of Loch Laven, Scotland's largest lowland loch. It runs between Kinross Pier and Vane Farm and has access for walkers, cyclers, and wheelchairs. The loch is a nature reserve for rare plants, insects, and birds. Kirkcud Brightshire. Cairn Holy, 1 and 2 Cairns. These two Neolithic burial cairns are remarkably complete and are situated on a hill with lovely views over Wigtown Bay.
they are both open to the sky, their coverings stolen long ago. The first cairn is between four and six thousand years old and has gone through several incarnations. The excavations revealed unusual interiors, including what is believed to be the tomb of Galdus, a mythical Scottish king. Some of the artifacts discovered were from far away, such as a fragment from a jadeite axe from the Alps, as well as shards of Neolithic pottery, a leaf-shaped arrowhead, Peterborough ware and beaker ware pottery shards, and a flint knife. It is a bit of a hike from the parking lot, so come prepared. The sign only mentions the one cairn, but seek out the second one, which is out of sight. It is well worth a visit. Go through the gate at the north end of the first cairn to access the track to the second one. The balancing slab is massive and almost perfectly flat. McClellan's Castle Built in 1582 by the McClellan family, this once the grandest house now stands in ruin, its square and solid, imposing against the skyline, a testament to family ruin and poor decisions. It was partially built with the stones from the ruined convent of Greyfriars nearby, as well as the stones from the old royal castle in Kirkubri. Perhaps this cannibalism doomed his home to ruin in the future? By all accounts, Sir Thomas McClellan was not above bending the law to his own designs, which led to his failure when the cost of troops to keep his Irish lands grew too high. He ended up as a glover working in Edinburgh, while other branches of the family retained ownership of the castle. It's now in the care of historic Scotland. The castle never saw hostile action or generations of remodeling, so it stands as it had after it was, in turn, cannibalized by other builders. Sanker Castle While it isn't easy to find, it is a fascinating place once you do. Do take care, as this ruin is still crumbling. It was built by the Crichton family circa 1400 who sold it in the mid-17th century to Sir William Douglas, 1st Duke of Queensbury who eventually sold it in 1895 to John Crichton Stuart, 3rd Marquess of Butte, who wished to restore his ancestral home, following successful restorations at Cardiff Castle and Castell Cock in Wales. This was undertaken by arts and crafts architect and landscape designer, Robert Ware Schultz. The square and more structurally sound sections rebuilt of that time can still be clearly identified. Work ended following the Marquis' death in 1900. What remains is a mix of restoration and original stonework, but still very far from completion. There are some odd noises when the wind blows through, possibly the ghost of Marion of Dalpeter, also known as the White Lady, a girl who disappeared in 1590, supposedly murdered. A young skeleton was found in 1895, assumed to be that of Marion. Sweetheart Abbey Named after the embalmed heart of John de Balliol, this abbey was established circa 1100 CE for the Cistercians, known as the White Monks for their white habits. Lady Dervergilla signed the charter and loved her husband so much, she had his heart embalmed and placed in an ivory box with enameled silver trimmings. She was buried with her husband's heart box next to her in the sanctuary of the church. It is situated in a lovely valley near the village of New Abbey. The abbey itself is built in deep red sandstone and was a daughter house to Dundrennan Abbey, thus became known as the New Abbey. If you are lucky enough to visit during a sunny day, the red of the sandstone can be quite stunning. Lanarkshire St. Bride's Church, Douglas this church is also known as Old St. Bride's Church, to distinguish it from the current parish church, also known as St. Bride's. Associated with the Black Douglas family, there's been a church on the site since the early 1300s, and some of the graves and mausoleums reflect that. There is one to the 7th Earl of Douglas in 1443 CE, and one to Sir James Douglas in 1330 CE, who took Robert the Bruce's heart on crusade. You can gain access inside if the key holder is available, there is a sign to tell you where. Inside, there is a clock thought to have been built in the 1560s, a gift from Mary, Queen of Scots, which may be the oldest working clock in Scotland. It chimes three minutes early, in honor of the Douglas family motto of never behind. One Lockhead Care to visit the highest village in the UK and the highest pub in Scotland? 
come to Wanlock Head, at an elevation of more than 1,500 feet above sea level, was founded in 1680 by the Duke of Buccleuch, who built a smelting plant and cottages for the workers. Wanlock Head is at the head of the Menic Pass, part of the Southern Uplands, now boasts a lead mining museum, a walking trail, an old village smithy, and the highest pub in Scotland, the Wanlock Head Inn. The name comes from the Gaelic Quinjalac, or Narrow Place. There are gold and lead deposits in the hills, exploited since Roman times. The regalia of the Scottish crown used some of the gold mined here, which tested as some of the purest gold in the world. World of Wings Would you like to learn how to fly a falcon, owl, or hawk? Located within the Cumbernauld Outdoor Activity Center in North Lanarkshire, the World of Wings has the largest collection of birds of prey in Scotland. They are involved in conservation and breeding projects, as well as providing falconry courses and educational talks. The Outdoor Activity Center also offers paintballing, archery, and off-road driving. Midlothian Camera Obscura, Edinburgh Welcome to the Land of Illusion! Edinburgh's oldest visitor attraction since 1835, this exhibit explores the different ways in which mirrors, photography, and visual illusion can trick the eye and the mind. There is a vortex tunnel, a mirror maze, kaleidoscopes, holograms, the Ames Room, and the Camera Obscura itself, which I particularly enjoyed, as an artist. The rooftop view is amazing, and it has high-powered telescopes and binoculars to use. Explore six floors of hands-on, interactive exhibits, a great indoor alternative on a rainy day in Edinburgh. Dune Hill Settlement While this site is of great archaeological importance, being one of the few settlements in southeast Scotland from the Anglo-Saxon Northumbrians of the 6th and 7th centuries, it is not physically impressive for those with little interest in the history. The former settlement is marked out on the field with narrow concrete paths, showing where the walls had been. It may have been the site of a pre-Christian temple, from the details found at the burial enclosure. A timber hall had been built, probably for a local Anglo-Saxon lord. There is evidence that the hall was destroyed by fire after fifty to a hundred years' use, but quickly rebuilt. Greyfriars Kirk In the heart of Edinburgh's old town, this small church has no steeple, so it's not as easy to find. Look for the Greyfriars Bobby's Bar, and you will see the passage to the church. It is a beautiful building, restored with lovely stained glass windows. The National Covenant was signed here in 1638, but there are other reasons it is so well known. You can find the grave of policeman John Gray, whose Sky Terrier, Bobby, a.k.a. Greyfriars Bobby, waited there every day for fourteen years, until his own death. There is a small statue of the wee dog in front of the pub, and a Disney movie made about the story. Museum of Fire Many people don't realize that Edinburgh was the location of the first municipal fire brigade in Europe. This museum helps recount that history between 1824 and the 1940s. There are engines, equipment, and uniforms on display for the visitor. You can see horse-drawn pumps, hand-pulled pumps, and all sorts of interesting and antique equipment. There are also poignant memorials to those lost in fighting fires throughout the years, including one to those firefighters lost in New York on September 11th. It is located on the ground floor of the Lothian and Borders Fire and Rescue Service. Do not be fooled by the modest exterior, as it hides a much larger interior area. Underground Edinburgh There are a couple of attractions, such as the Real Mary King's Close and the Edinburgh Vaults. The Real Mary King's Close, who doesn't love a good ghost story? Especially if the location is creepy and quiet even in the bustle of the modern world? In the 1600s, this warren of underground streets was closed off to prevent the spreading of plague. It is filled with mystery, tales of ghosts and cruel horrors. You can tour the area with a costumed guide with a flair for the melodramatic. The Edinburgh Vaults, this is a series of chambers underneath the city of Edinburgh itself, formed from almost 20 arches of the South Bridge, built in 1788. These vaults used to hold all manner of shops, hold smuggled goods, and hidden bodies. 
Ghost tours are conducted through here as well, and end at a venue called The Caves and the Rowan Tree. It was named after a prominent businesswoman in the 1630s, a widow who traded in fabrics. The ghosts reputed to haunt the area include a young girl, and countless dolls and toys have been left to placate her troubled spirit over the years. Rosslyn Chapel Everything you've heard about this place is true, the carvings are amazing and incredible. It's a small place, and yes, the outside is covered with a permanent canopy to protect the stonework from the elements. But the carvings are mostly on the inside and will take your breath away. No surface in this church has been left uncarved. Little angels cavort on the columns, devils carved upside down. Also around the chapel, you'll find hand-carved figures of animals, human figures, and items from nature such as seashells and sheaves of corn and wheat. You can't help but notice the apprentice pillar, the only spiral structural support in the chapel. As the story goes, the master stonemason was going away for a few days and told his apprentices he wanted to be impressed when he returned, create pillars of hand-carved stonework to impress him. On his return, one apprentice had created a spiral pillar. So jealous did the master mason become that he took up a hammer and bludgeoned the apprentice to death. The master mason was arrested and put to death. There are three faces around the church, the master mason, the apprentice with a hammer mark on his forehead, and that of the grieving mother. A basement crypt is also open which features the tomb of the second Earl of Rosslyn who died in 1837. He wished to be buried in the original vault, variously rumored to be the resting place of Jesus Christ's head, the Holy Grail, and or the treasures of the Templars, reputed to be the original Scottish crown jewels. An exhaustive search was made, but no entrance to the original vault was found, so he was buried beside his wife in the Lady Chapel, which is entered into through a small door near the altar. Rosslyn was used in the filming of the movie, The Da Vinci Code, which has reinvigorated interest in this site. Royal Botanic Garden If you are intimidated by the hustle and bustle of Edinburgh, go for a relaxing walk in the gardens. It started in 1670 as a physic garden for medicinal plants. Now it includes a herbarium, alpine plants, a Chinese hillside, glasshouses with several different environments on display, rainforest plants, peat walls, waterfalls, a Scottish heath garden, and many more. Entrance is free, though there is a small charge to go into the glasshouses. There are four Royal Botanic Garden locations around Scotland, in Edinburgh, Dawick, Logan, and Benmore, and each has a particular collection of plant life. The total collection numbers more than 13,000 living plant species, and the herbarium has over 3 million preserved specimens. Scotch Whiskey Experience, on the Royal Mile in Edinburgh, stop in to sample some drams. This is no staid, standing around tour, gazing at empty barrels and sealed vats. Take the silver tour in a whiskey barrel ride through the production plant, being part of the process of making whiskey, discovering the history of the drink, and experience the different flavors the regions and locations impart to this amber liquid. Samples are available at the end, though the children are given urn brew, which has an indescribable flavor with a medicinal aftertaste similar to ginger. It must be tasted to be appreciated. St. Margaret's Chapel, Edinburgh Castle Edinburgh Castle itself is far from a hidden gem. Indeed, the imposing structure juts up out of the hills of the city like a century and crowning the medieval heart of Edinburgh. However, St. Margaret's is the oldest part of the site and is quite tiny and peaceful. It dates to circa 12th century and likely built for St. Margaret's son, David I. It was restored in the 19th century to the form it is today. Robert the Bruce captured the castle in 1314 and destroyed all of the buildings except for this chapel. On his deathbed in 1329, Bruce issued orders for the chapel's repaint, leaving some 40 pounds for restoration. From that time, the chapel was known as the Royal Chapel of the Castle. There are several beautiful stained glass windows, including one of St. Brendan the Navigator, an Irish explorer monk from the 5th century. Other windows show St. Andrew, St. Margaret, St. Columba, 
St. Ninian, and William Wallace. They were created by the artist Douglas Strachan. Stone of Destiny Also known as the Stone of Scone and the Coronation Stone, for centuries it was used in the coronation of Scottish monarchs and later those of England and Great Britain. The stone was last used in 1953 for the coronation of Elizabeth II. There are many tales and legends about this stone, including that in 1314, then King of Munster, Cormac McCarthy, is said to have sent 4,000 soldiers to aid Robert the Bruce at the Battle of Bannockburn. Bruce showed his gratitude by gifting the McCarthy with half the Stone of Destiny. While this is a very romantic story and quite believable, the Stone of Destiny is actually red sandstone while the Blarney Stone is blue stone, another type of sandstone, which puts this romantic story to rest. Regardless of its origins, geologically, from Scone, hence the name Stone of Scone, pronounced Stone of Scone with a soft O, it was taken by Edward I to Westminster and placed under the throne until 1996, when it was returned to Edinburgh Castle. A replica stone can be found at Scone Palace, in Scone near Perth. Moray Ardclack Bell Tower This architectural oddity is quite small, and easily missed. It's only two levels, ground and first floor, and could be mistaken for a prison. And in a way it probably was. This structure dates to 1655, according to a stone slab on the gable end opposite the bell tower, and was built by Alexander Bertie of Lethen, a covenanter, a small 17th-century Presbyterian movement. Brody's religious beliefs made him a traitor to King Charles I, and as a result his lands and property were repeatedly sacked in 1645. He built this tower as a means of defense. The tower stands on a hill with a lovely, albeit strategic, view. On an interior wall are the stone-carved initials, MGB, Margaret Grant Brody, who was Alexander's second wife. The summit of the hill is so small that it was terraced on one side to bolster the footprint of the tower. The tower was eventually acquired by the Ardclack Church to use as a bell tower, which was added at that time, presumably because the high elevation meant the sound of the bell would be heard in a much greater distance than from the church in the valley. However, that never happened, and in 1838 when the building was restored, it continued as a belfry but was never used for the purpose in which it was meant. Auchindown Castle This 15th-century ruined tower castle was built on the remains of an Iron Age hill fort. There are prehistoric and Pictish earthworks on these grounds. It was built by Thomas Cochran, who later became the Earl of March. It was then passed to the Clan Ogilvy in 1489, and then on to Clan Gordon in 1535. Following the restoration of Charles II, the castle was again awarded to the Marquis of Huntley. It was destroyed by the Clan Mackintosh in 1592, and many of the stones removed and used elsewhere in the region, including Balvenie Castle. It was totally derelict by 1725 and has never been restored, though the remaining ruins are still impressive. At one point, the site contained a stable, brewery, bakery, and cellars, and the dungeons, which were carved into the bedrock beneath the tower. Condemned for many years as too dangerous, the structure was stabilized and opened to the public in 2007. Brody Castle this restored manor house, home to the Brody family, was originally built in 1567, but destroyed in a fire less than 100 years later. It was rebuilt and expanded in the early 19th century when the manor house was added onto the castle and is now very well preserved and open to visitors, weddings, and events. The interior is truly impressive, with all sorts of magnificent details, such as the Victorian kitchen, the day nursery, complete with a children's cooking range and a dining room. In true Victorian fashion, the attention to detail, particularly on the dining room ceiling, are incredible. There is an ancient Pictish monument on the grounds called Rodney's Stone, a two-yard high cross slab with carvings on both sides. One side has a cross, and the other, symbols of fish monsters, a beast, and a double disc. The stone has an inscription, the longest of all Pictish inscriptions, in Ogham writing. 
While some of it is weathered beyond legibility, some does contain the name of a Pictish saint, St. Ethernan. Bighead Promontory Fort and Well Unfortunately, most of this impressive structure was dismantled and built over in the early 19th century to create homes for those displaced in the highland clearances. However, what remains is still impressive. The fort was likely the seat of power for the Pictish kingdom of Fortriu and was in its glory from circa 300 to 800 CE. The fortress was originally seven and a half acres large and contained a chambered well, probably used in ritual. Many carved Pictish stones were part of the original structure, but only a few survived the dismantling. Many had bull carvings, a symbol not normally found in other Pictish carvings, they became known as the Big Head Bulls. Those few are now housed in the visitor center, which also recreates the former glory of the site. Elgin Cathedral Majestic and imposing, this spectacular cathedral is stunning even in its ruin. What remains are the bones of its former glory. This cathedral was established in 1224 and dedicated to the Holy Trinity on land granted by King Alexander II, replacing the cathedral at Spiney a few miles away. It was staffed by 18 canons by 1226 which increased to 23 by 1242. Through the centuries, the church suffered through sackings and burnings, but increased its size with each restoration. And by 1560, the time of the Scottish Reformation, the number of canons had increased to 25. Elgin Cathedral became the second largest cathedral in Scotland, behind St. Andrew's which was the largest. As a result of the Reformation, the cathedral was abandoned, its services transferring to the parish church of St. Giles. Once the lead waterproofing was removed from the room in 1567, the church quickly fell into ruin and rapid decay. The site was tidied in Victorian times, a time when visiting graveyards came into fashion, but the church was never restored and remains open today for casual visitors. Notable mentions are the intact chapter house and its elegant, vaulted ceiling, the Pictish cross slab, and the stone figures of a bishop and a knight in the nave. While you can climb to the top of the North Tower, beware if you suffer vertigo. Nairnshire Cotter Castle This restored late 4th century castle dates back to circa 1180 when the first Thane of Cotter, or Calder as it was originally spelled, was appointed sheriff and hereditary constable of the royal castle at Nairn. Thane is the equivalent of Baron. The keep received its license to fortify in 1454. It's unknown who originally built the first structure, but by this time it was well in the possession of Calders, and William Calder, the sixth thane of Cotter. This site has some unique features, including being built around a small living holly tree. Legend says that a donkey laden with gold laid down to rest under the tree, and the site for the castle was chosen. The remains of that tree are still evident in the lowest chamber in the castle, called the Thorn Tree Room. The castle is associated with Shakespeare's Macbeth, as he was hailed as the Thane of Cotter by the Three Witches. However, the true Macbeth died 130 years before the title existed and was likely changed subsequently from the Thane of Cromarty. There is a gift shop on site, as well as a bookshop, a wool shop, and restaurant. The extensive estate and walled garden are open to visitors, as well as the golf course and natural woodlands. Clava Cairns. Nearby Culloden, you can find the Clava Cairns. The Clava Cairn is a type of Bronze Age circular chamber tomb cairn and named after the group of three cairns at Balnirin of Clava. There were several cairns and stone circles in Clava, and it was a fascinating place, even in the bright sunlight. The stones themselves had many interesting patterns on them, not necessarily carved patterns, but the stones themselves and the lichen growing on them were lovely. One is covered in cut marks, small man-made concave indentations. Nairn Beach Low sand dunes and a promenade stretch along the Nairn coastline, making this a lovely walking beach, where you can look across the Moray Firth to the Black Isles. If you fancy a long walk, there is a nearby nature reserve with several coastal walks. It is a great family picnic spot. There is a resident school of dolphins in the water itself. Orkney 
While this may seem like a long way to travel, the Orkneys have many lovely places to visit, explore, and experience. There are countless Neolithic and Viking sites to see, as well as a wonderful mix of Pictish and Norse culture throughout the islands. Balfour Castle Located in the Orkney Islands on Shappensay, this is the most northerly castle hotel in the world. It's a Victorian structure, built on an island you can reach by ferry from Kirkwall. The village was created to support the estate in the late 18th century and offers lovely views of the other islands from Ward Hill. The castle itself has turrets, a castellated tower, and large picture windows. There are several historic outbuildings, such as a smithy, gatehouse, gas house, and the largest water-powered grinding mill in Orkney. There is a standing stone called Moor Stein, standing at three yards high, said to have been thrown from the mainland by a giant, after his fleeing wife. There is a chambered cairn with the colorful name of Castle Bloody. The Brock of Burroughs Tun is a Pictish tower. Bishops and Earl's Palaces Located in the town of Kirkwall, these palaces are considered two of the best examples of architecture in Scotland and show both Norse and ecclesiastic elements. The fireplace, in particular, is spectacular. The front façade has a complex array of corbel turrets and oriel windows. The bishop's palace was built by the Stuarts, at the same time as St. Magnus Cathedral, see below, and is where King Hawkin IV died, marking the end of Norse rule in the Outer Hebrides. The Earl's Palace was built in the early 1600s, mostly by forced labor, when the Lord of Orkney felt the bishop's palace no longer suited his needs. Complicating matters, the Stuarts did not actually own the land on which they built. While under arrest, his son waged a battle to claim the land and capture the palace, but he too was arrested, and both father and son were eventually executed. The properties eventually fell into the hands of the crown and went to ruin by the 18th century. Though the roof is missing, it retains some of the elegance of its original Renaissance architecture. Blackamer Cairn this chambered cairn on Rousse in Orkney has gotten a reconstructed concrete roof to protect the remains of the cairn from the elements. Seven chambers are divided by upright stone slabs, set in a distinctive decorative design. This triangular design is mirrored in unstand pottery patterns from the area. The roof has translucent panels to let light into the chambers, but you can still see the cairn walls and chambers with the original construction. Some of the items discovered in the cairn are flint knives, remains of an unstan urn, animal bones and the remains of two humans. Brock of Gurness slash Midhow Brock This is a Pictish tower with a very large and complex footprint on the edge of a windswept and stormy coast. It was inhabited until circa 100 CE and likely housed an extended family. It was probably used as a last defensive resort for an entire surrounding village, though, during times of attack. There is evidence that it was used as a Viking burial site in later years, from grave goods and human remains. You might also want to check out the nearby Midhow Brock across the Einhallow Sound on Rousse. This one stands on a tall cliff and is well excavated with extensive outbuildings. Exceptional views here. You can sometimes see seals in the waters below the cliff, perhaps on the small sandy beach. Broth of Bercy. Occupied by first the Picts and then the Norse, this important center is only accessible at low tide. The parking lot is at the point of Buckoy, and then steps take you to the natural causeway. Make sure you have time to return before the tide does. An enclosure around the Norse church surrounds the Pictish graveyard, and there is a symbol stone left from their legacy. The stone portrays Pictish nobles in long robes, bearing weapons and shields. There are church remains, dedicated to St. Peter, from about 1100 years ago. There may have been a monastery on the grounds at one point, as well as a possible sauna and bathhouse. Don't miss visiting the small Romanesque church, which dates back to the 12th century. Dedicated to St. Peter, it is made of fine red sandstone. It was a pilgrimage site and may have replaced an earlier Pictish holy place. While it is square at one end, the other end is a semicircular apse. 
Broth of Dearness No one is certain what the Broth of Dearness was, originally. It could have been a pre-Norse Christian settlement, or it could be an Iron Age cliff-top fortification. In the 1970s, excavators uncovered the remains of a chapel dating back to the pre-Norse period, which now stand about four or five feet high. Extensive excavations in 2008 revealed the site was a Viking chieftain settlement. It was definitely domestic, as the artifacts found were spindles, pottery, loom weights, etc. However, there is still a possibility that it covered an earlier structure. The peninsula this broth is on just clings to the eastern edge of the main Orkney Island, only attached by a strip of sandbar. On the way to the broth, you can see the glup, what used to be a sea cave, but is now collapsed into a deep gorge. A bit of scrambling is required, but it is reasonably accessible to the able-bodied. Covenanters Memorial is a memorial to the 200 Covenanters who drowned along the coast when their prison ship foundered in a storm. Churchill Barriers During World War II, operations for the Navy fleet were moved to Scapa Flow, in the Orkneys. In order to guard the approach to the base, a series of four causeways were built here, with a total length of one and a half miles. They link the northern part of Orkney mainland to the island of South Ronaldsay via Bay and the two smaller islands of Lamb Home and Glimpse Home. These barriers were built primarily as naval defenses to protect the anchorage at Scapa Flow, but they now serve as road links, carrying the A961 road from Kirkwall to Berwick. There is a series of sunken ships and debris between the islands, deliberately sunk by Churchill to keep enemy submarines from getting to the fleet. These resting wrecks are still visible even at high tide, with bits sticking up through the water. Italian Chapel The Italian Chapel was built by Italian POWs out of a Quonset hut and scraps of iron. They painted the inside as if it was lined in tiles, in true trompe l'oeil style, and created ironwork for the inside, making a magical religious wonderland inside. Sadly, it was only used as a chapel for a couple years, but I am very glad the folks of Orkney were smart and kind enough to have preserved this little gem. May Show This Neolithic structure may have originally been a standing stone site, as the four corners of the interior have standing stones with carvings. It is considered the finest chambered tomb in the northwest of Europe, and predates the Egyptian pyramids. There is a guided tour here which I highly recommend. The guide offers a great deal of history about the area, the tomb, its discovery, and the various people who had occupied it. Viking writing on the walls that differed little from modern-day graffiti, including suggestive innuendos, is translated through the guide. One translation suggested, Ivar has a huge axe. The tunnel in is low and long, so a bit of stooping is required. There is enough room for perhaps 20 people to stand inside, a bit snugly, but it is well worth some time. It is a fascinating glimpse into two distinct cultures, the original Neolithic builders, and the Vikings, for a thousand years later. At sunset on winter solstice, the entire length of the passage lights up with the sun shining on the rear wall of the central chamber. Old Man of Hoy UK's tallest sea stack, the old man rises out of the sea at 450 feet and can usually be seen from the ferry to Orkney, if the conditions are clear enough. The striations in the red sandstone give it a dramatic appearance, especially in the rain, as the colors are vibrant and stunning. The old man is probably less than 250 years old. It is not mentioned in the Orkneyinga saga, written circa 1230. On the Blau map of 1600 CE, a headland exists to the point where the old man is now. The Mackenzie map of Hoy of 1750 similarly shows a headland but no stack, though by 1819, the old man had been separated from the mainland. Artist William Daniel sketched the sea stack at this time as a wider column with a smaller top section and an arch at the base, giving the form legs. A short time later, a storm washed away one of the legs leaving it much as it is today, although erosion continues. In 1992 a 130-foot crack appeared in the top of the south face, leaving a large overhanging section that will eventually collapse. This has not deterred climbers and base jumpers and film crews. 
or Fear Church and the Earl's Boo. Off a side road near the Hoy Ferry Terminus, this odd little round church ruin is near the Orkneyinga Saga Center, celebrating the Viking heritage of the area. It is the only surviving circular medieval church in Scotland. The church was modeled after the rotunda of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. Most of the church was destroyed to build the nearby church in 1757, and that is also now long gone. In the Orkneyinga Saga, written in 1136 CE, there is an account of a great Yule feast given by Earl Paul at his BU, or residence, at Orphirs. There was a large drinking hall, the door was near the east gable on the southern wall, and a magnificent church stood before the hall door, and one had to go down to the church from the hall. The remains of that magnificent church are dedicated to St. Nicholas and still survive. The Boo was a manor house in the 1100s of the Norse Earls of Orkney, and the round church of St. Nicholas is just near it. There isn't much left of either, but there are some walls and foundations marked. There is a great collection of gravestones and markers, as well as lovely views over the scop of flow. Ring of Broger Any trip to Orkney would be incomplete without a visit to this site. It's not a hidden site, but it is worth a mention because it is truly impressive. The large circle of stones, measuring 114 yards in diameter, lies just north of the Stennis Stones on the main Orkney Island. There is an earthen ditch around the stones, and the very flat surrounding land and islands make it seem like you can skip stones for miles, just hitting each small island on the way. The site has never been fully excavated or scientifically dated, so it remains shrouded in mystery and myth. However, it is likely that it was built between 2500 and 2000 BCE. It is thought it originally had 60 stones, but only 27 remain. It's the third largest circle in the British Isles, after Avebury and Stanton Drew. Recent ongoing excavations in the nearby Ness of Broger have revealed an extensive domestic complex of Neolithic buildings, artwork, pottery, bones and tools, in an area of about six acres. The site dates from circa 3200 to 2300 BCE, which makes it concurrent with the building of the Ring of Broger. St. Magnus Cathedral the word of the day is red. Red and white sandstone make this 12th century cathedral, the carvings of which would be spectacular anyway, unique and exquisite, especially in the rain when the stone is wet. It is also the most northerly cathedral in the British Isles. There is fantastic curvilinear ironwork on the massive oak doors and soaring Romanesque archways in red sandstone to greet the visitor. St. Magnus was reputed to be pious and gentle. He refused to fight or raid and was granted a share of the earldom of Orkney held by his cousin, Hawken. They ruled peaceably for some years until their followers started arguing. An assembly was set to settle the matter, and Hawken brought more ships than they had agreed upon. Magnus was captured and then killed by his treacherous cousin. The interior has more curvilinear designs, this time carved from stone, throughout the chapel. This is the largest building in Kirkwall, smack in the center of town, and a fantastic rallying point for groups that wander, or a base for giving directions through the winding streets of the city. It should be noted that Street Magnus is not owned by the church, but by the Burg of Kirkwall. This was a result of an act of King James III of Scotland following Orkney's annexation in 1468 by the Scottish Crown. And it has its own dungeon. Scop of Flow this body of water is sheltered by a string of islands around the main Orkney Island. It has a shallow sandy bottom and is therefore a great natural harbor. Viking ships used it a thousand years ago, and it was pivotal in the wars of the Three Kingdoms in 1650. In World War I and World War II, it was Britain's chief naval base, until it closed in 1956. Its protected location was considered ideal against German submarine threats, once Churchill sunk ships in nearby channels to form the Churchill Barriers. Scarab Bray Known as the Scottish Pompeii, this site is truly impressive and a must-see for anyone in this corner of Scotland. Most of the sites we see from this time period are religious in nature, like Stonehenge or the Pyramids. But this site feels very homey, with chambers and hearts. 
catch a glimpse into what everyday life may have been like for people who lived here and realize it wasn't all that different from ours today. There is also a small cafe, a visitor center, and a mock-up of the site. Included in the ticket for Scarabray is Scottle House, a grand mansion that has stood since the 1600s and has an eclectic collection of artifacts, from Captain Cook's dinner service to a Viking calendar stick. Stennis Stones Dated to circa 3100 BCE, this is one of the oldest stone circles in Britain. The tallest stone stands at 19 feet, truly dwarfing all around it. Located near the center of the main Orkney Island, this set of standing stones is on a farm on a tiny neck of land leading to the Ring of Broger. It is very easy to explore, as there is parking on the road right next to it. The views of the surrounding islands and inlets are magnificent, and if you are lucky enough to get there on a summer solstice, you will have to be there very late to see the sun set, after midnight. Tradition states that, during the five days of feasting around New Year, lovers can visit the Stennis Stones. The woman kneels and prays to the god Wadden that she and her partner will keep the oaths they are about to swear. Then they go to the Ring of Broger and repeat the ritual pact before the Odin Stone. Tomb of the Eagles Also known as a spicer chambered cairn, got its nickname from the number of sea eagle bones found within the tomb when it was excavated. It's a long drive to the end of the island string from the main Orkney Island, but it's worth the drive and the mile hike. Not just for the tomb, but for the incredible angular cliffs and seabirds which inhabit the area. Everything is at an angle, which is how the tomb was discovered, the tomb stones were straight and seemed out of place. To get into the tomb, you have to lay on a wheeled board and pull yourself into the tomb on a rope, but once inside, it's high enough to stand in. Interior lighting is provided from the skylights. The walk back along the cliffs is highly recommended. There are plenty of seabirds and wildflowers dot the landscape from spring through summer. Unstan Cairn This cairn is on a promontory near the Stennis Lock, near the Ring of Broger. This one is similar on the outside to Maysho, but inside the architecture is different. There are large flagstone slabs dividing the main chamber into circular stalls, giving them the classification of stalled tombs. The roof is a modern concrete construction with a skylight, offering natural interior light and to preserve the site. In construction, it's a hybrid of the Maysho chambered tomb and the Orkney Cromarty design of circular tombs. The name Unstan was given to the large amount of pottery scattered around the floor. There were at least 30 Neolithic bowls in the tomb, distinctive by their round bottoms and linear decorations. They were found along with human and animal bones. Vat of Kerbister, on the island of Stronzi in Orkney, this rock arch is the roof of a very large, almost circular cave that's collapsed. There is a laby nearby to park in, and then a path runs between fields to get to this inlet. While visiting the arch, don't miss the nearby sea stack called the Mound, which houses the remains of an early Christian hermitage. While you can get quite close to the arch, a fence is placed to keep visitors off the precarious rocks. There is another sea stack nearby, called Tam's Castle, with another hermitage on top. These early Christians evidently went to a great deal of trouble to guarantee their solitude. P. Blesher Dog House and Botanical Garden This 13th-century manor house was built by the Veach family and then passed on to the Balfers. It was destroyed in 1830 but rebuilt. It has an extensive botanic garden as well as a chapel to explore. The gardens are about 60 acres along the River Tweed and have one of the best arboretums in the world due to 300 years of tree collecting by the three different families. Walk along the beach walk or explore the Azalea Terrace. They are part of the three gardens that form the Royal Botanic Gardens, along with Edinburgh, Benmore Botanic Garden, and Logan Botanic Garden. Stobo Kirk Dedicated to St. Mungo, and probably founded in the 6th century, it is one of the oldest standing churches in Scotland. 
While it is a Protestant church, it retains many of the splendid decor of the Catholic churches, including the door made from cedar of Lebanon, 17th-century brass hanging lamps, and the beautiful stained glass windows. Don't miss churchyard gravestones and carvings, some of which are unusual and fascinating, such as Robert Vesey's grave marker, or that of John Noble and his musket. The legend says that Street Mungo, also known as Street Kentigern, converted Merton Wilt, Merlin, to Christianity and baptized him on a boulder. That boulder was made into the altar stone at Stobo. Robert Smale's Printing Works This is a fully functional Victorian letterpress printer, showing the operations of a 19th-century printer. Smales ran a weekly newspaper between 1893 and 1916 and was open to the public in 1990. There is a tour showing the stages of the printing process, as well as some hands-on workshops. Exhibits of stationery, writing slates, sealing wax, letter cases and compositors tell you all you want to know about the printing trade of the time. Perthshire Beatrix Potter Exhibition Escape back to the days of your childhood or introduce your own children to the world of Peter Rabbit. This extensive exhibition in Dunkeld is a great stop for the young, or just young at heart. This is a place where your favorite characters come alive and the world of Beatrix Potter comes to life. If the weather is poor, enjoy the indoor exhibition along with the tea room and gift shop for a break. Black Watch Museum Located within Balhousie Castle in Perth, this museum is open all year and tells the story of Scotland's best-known military regiment, which goes back 300 years. There are gardens, a gift shop and a cafe to relax in, as well as a collection of paintings, artifacts and photographs to explain the history. Blair Castle and Gardens Blair Castle had a rather intriguing start. In 1269, while David I. Strathbridge, Earl of Athol, was called away to the Crusades, his northern neighbor, John I. Coman, Lord of Badenoch, began building on the Earl's land. When the Earl returned and found what his neighbor was doing, he complained to King Alexander III and won back his lands. He then incorporated the new tower into an extension to his own home. David II Strathbridge, Earl of Athol, was eventually forced to forfeit his titles and estates after rebelling against Robert the Bruce in 1322. The earldom was granted to a number of individuals until 1457 when James II granted it to his half-brother, John Stuart. In 1629, John Murray, son of the second Earl of Tullibardine, was created Earl of Athol, and the title has remained in the Murray family ever since. This spectacular white turreted castle is considered the ancestral home of the Clan Murray. The current Duke of Athol, John Murray, lives in South Africa, and his father had given the estate into a charitable trust to be left under Scottish control. It is open to the public, and the restored rooms have collections of weapons, trophies, paintings, furniture, and tapestries. It is the garrison for the Athol Highlanders, the Duke's private army, and the only legal private army in Europe. Dunfallandy Stone A Pictish cross slab that stands alone about a mile south of Pitlochry, this ancient carving is accessible from a small road just off the A9. The walk is a couple of hundred yards past a farmhouse and a bit of a climb. The stone itself is under a glass and stone structure for protection from the elements. It stands about five feet high and dates to about the 700s. There is an elaborate cross carved on the face with symbols and figures on the other side with angels and animals. Fish-tailed snakes form a frame around the images of symbols and figures. The figures on one side are thought by some to be St. Paul and St. Anthony. It is known locally as Clachen Tisagert or the Priest's Stone. Dunkeld Cathedral the current church was established in 1260 but not actually completed until 1501. Located on the north bank of the River Tay, this location has been holy ground since at least 730 CE when Coldees, Celtic missionaries, built a monastery here. The King of Scots and Picts, Kenneth MacAlpin, had the original church rebuilt in 848 CE. 
Dunkelt became the religious center of Scotland when the relics of St. Columbo were moved here after Viking attacks ravaged the monasteries of the west coast. The current cathedral has both Gothic and Norman architecture, reflecting its various histories in a fascinating contrast due to the length of time it took to complete. It holds several ancient carvings, such as the Apostle's Stone, the Old Bell and the Pictish Cross Slab, from circa 800 CE. Falls of Dockhart While this is a fast-flowing river, there are areas slow enough to allow climbing onto some of the rocks. On either side, there are interesting buildings, the Breedlebane Folklore Center and the Falls of Dockhart Inn. While the Folklore Center started life out as a mill, the inn started out as a blacksmithy in the late 19th century. The Bridge of Dockhart, built in 1760, crosses the river to Killen. From the bridge, you will see the Cascades of Falls and an island called Innisvui, which is the burial place of the Clan McNab. In the center of the grounds, you will find an oblong enclosure which holds the burials of nine of the clan chiefs. Finlerig Castle With a rather bloody history, the ruins of this castle are hidden away along a deep forest path along the River Lochy, near Killen. It was built in 1629 by Black Duncan Campbell, of the Campbells of Breedlebane. It includes a stone-lined pit, legendarily used for beheading prisoners of noble blood. Commoners were not accorded such courtesy, though, they were hanged on a nearby oak tree. Finlerig's most notorious visitor was Rob Roy who reputedly stayed here in 1713. Nearby are the remnants of the Breedlebane Mausoleum, built circa 1830 in a mock Tudor style. This mausoleum was built over a former church and burial grounds which had been established in 1523. Explore both areas with caution, as these are not maintained ruins, and loose stones are likely. The Hermitage Pleasure Ground Located near Dunkeld, this lovely forest is home to Oshin's Hall of Mirrors, Oshin's Cave, and others are Georgian follies built by the Dukes of Athol. Oshin was a blind bard in Celtic legend, styled after the Irish bard, Oshin. The Hermit's Cave was built circa 1760 for the Earl of Breedlebane to honor the bard. He advertised, unsuccessfully, for a permanent hermit to live there, basically as a tourist attraction. The Riverside Walk is about a mile to Oshin's Hall, which overlooks a triple waterfall. There is also a 30-mile network of paths beyond that, which date to the 18th century. A stone footbridge from 1770 is near the Blackland Falls. Two interesting features are found here, a Douglas fir tree which was recorded as the tallest tree in Britain at 200 feet, and beside the 1770s bridge is a cedar of Lebanon, which is meant to be the oldest living tree in the Hermitage, dating back to around the time of the bridge's construction. Hunting Tower Castle once known as Ruthven Castle and the Palace of Ruthven, it was built in the 15th century by the clan Ruthven, Earls of Gowrie. The Earl of Gowrie was involved in a plot to kidnap the son of Mary Queen of Scots, the young King James VI. The successful ten-month kidnapping was known as the Raid of Ruthven. In later years, Gowrie was implicated again in a plan to kill the king and was summarily executed, his properties and titles all confiscated. The castle is made up of two towers, the eastern tower, once the servants' quarters, and the western tower, once the family quarters. Of some of the surviving features in the castle, the greatest of them can be found in the eastern tower. These include early 16th-century wall painting on the tower's first floor, fragments showing flora and fauna, and biblical scenes. As well, there are decorative paintings on the timber ceiling which include Renaissance-style knotwork patterns on overlaying planks and grotesques, animal versions of the traditional green man. The ceiling is thought to be the earliest surviving examples of this style of art in Scotland. There are less impressive wall paintings in the Western Tower but definitely worth seeing. The castle has an interesting history with the Murray and Ruthven families, and a romantic story associated with the gap between the two towers, known as the Maiden's Leap, which gets its name from a daring leap made by the Earl's daughter, Dorothea. As the legend goes, Dorothea was in love with one of the servants and used a bridge between the towers to visit him. One night, her mother, the Countess, 
followed Dorothea who escaped to the roof as there was no other passage back to her chamber. From the roof, she leapt from the battlement onto a landing on the western tower and rushed to her chamber, where her mother found her. The following day, Dorothea and her lover eloped. There are no records of what happened to Dorothea after that night. However, visitors have said they've seen the ghost of a young woman in a green silk dress walking the halls. Her sighting is usually an omen that death is to come to those who see her. Some castles are famous for its ghosts, however, Hunting Tower is also famous for its bats. There is a colony of pipistrelle bats, which are the smallest bat in Europe. Visitors are warned the bats are not house-trained, evident by their leavings, so children should be tended while visiting. The castle has been carefully restored but is not furnished. You will see the bare stone walls, once plastered, hearths, and windows without the trappings of everyday life. Inchmahon Priory Located on an island in the Lake of Mentith, this serene, ruined abbey is well worth the short boat ride from the mainland. Technically, this is the only lake in Scotland, as it was named by an Englishman, all the rest are locks. The priory was founded in 1238 by the powerful Coman family as an Augustinian order and has an interesting list of visitors over the centuries. Some of the most notable include King Robert the Bruce who stayed here on three occasions, 1306, 1308, 1310, possibly for political purposes, as the priory at the time had sworn allegiance to King Edward I of England. The priory also served as refuge in 1547 for Queen Mary, who was four years of age at the time. The young Mary was hidden here following the disastrous defeat of the Scots army at the Battle of Pinky Clough during the Rough Wooing. The Rough Wooing was a conflict which arose when Henry VIII declared war against the Scots in an effort to force a marriage between his son, Edward, and the infant, Mary, who would later become known as Mary, Queen of Scots. In Scotland, this war was called the Eight Years' War, and also the Nine Years' War. The term rough wooing is attributed to George Gordon, 4th Earl of Huntley, who is quoted as saying, We liked not the manner of the wooing, and we could not stoop to being bullied into love. Later, the term wooing was popularized by Sir Walter Scott, and the phrase rough wooing was commonly seen in books from the mid-19th century. The priory fell into ruin after the Reformation, but this is a wonderful sight to explore. The chapter house is the best-preserved structure on the site, largely as it had been converted into a family mausoleum in the 18th century by the Graham family. You will see several fine carved medieval effigies which were placed here for preservation. Make sure to explore the vaulted ground floor of the kitchen. There is a small forest on the island that is worthy of exploration and serene reflection. If you are there in the right time of year, the forest floor is covered in bluebells. Keeler Symbol Stone The stone is 6 feet 5 inches in height and only carved on the side facing the road. It is well situated in a flat area and visible for miles. The carvings include a double disc and zirad, which may represent the dynasty of a line of Pictish kings, sort of like a coat of arms. The burial of a woman's bones and carvings of a less distinct mirror and comb symbol indicate it might be the burial tomb of a noblewoman, but that is open to speculation. At the top is the carving of an animal, either a wolf or a bear, with his mouth open. The stone is estimated at 1,200 years of age. Michaelure Beach Hedge If you have an urge to feel small and insignificant, seek out this odd hedge. Since 1966, this has been recognized as the tallest and longest hedge on earth. These beech trees average 100 feet in height and stretch along the roadside for one-third of a mile. The hedge was planted in 1745 by Robert Murray Nairn and his wife, Jean Mercer of Michaelur, shortly before the arrival of Bonnie Prince Charlie to Scotland. It is said that the beech trees stand tall and straight towards heaven because the men who helped plant the hedge were killed at the Battle of Culloden. It takes four men six weeks and a hydraulic lift to trim the hedge. Tinrake Stone Circle The word tinrake comes from the old Gaelic name Ty Naruake, or the House of the Heather. 
This place is hidden in plain sight, near Ballenluig in Perthshire. It's not that easy to find, but is actually on the grounds of Tinrake Nursery, so check opening times before visiting. This compact stone circle has six stones and is just shy of 22 feet in diameter. The largest stone is triangular in shape with ice cracking on the face of it. The excavation in 1855 revealed four ceramic urns with cremated remains, but those have been lost over time. Renfrewshire Castle Semple Lock. This lock is approximately one and a half miles in length, at the eastern end of which are the ruins of Castle Semple, built sometime between 1490 and 1520. There are many attractions around the lock, including a water sports center, a bird sanctuary, and of course, the ruins of the castle which are only accessible by boat. The ruins of a collegiate church built in 1505 are situated on the north shore and still retains the walls of the old walled garden. There is the octagonal temple on top of Kenmure Hill near the house, built as a hunting outlook in the 18th century. Peel Tower on the south shore can also only be reached by boat. This medieval stronghold was likely used by locals as defense against bandits. Glenifer Braes this range of hills south of Paisley is associated with the 18th and 19th century weaver poets of Paisley, such as Robert Tannehill and Hugh MacDonald. The Glenifer Gorge is situated along the Tannehill Walkway, about 50 feet deep, formed by the Glenifer Burn. The Craigulan Waterfall is lovely year-round, surrounded by forest and icing up with dramatic stalactites in the winter. Many birds can be seen in the area, including skylarks, sparrowhawks, goldcrests, and kestrels. Deer and tawny owls are around as well. The Lapwing Lodge Outdoor Center, circa 1910, was originally set up for Coates Mill workers as a sanatorium. Cycling and horseback riding is encouraged, as well as seasonal activities like Easter egg rolling and sledging. Paisley Abbey If you love beautiful stained glass and architecture, you should visit Paisley Abbey. Dedicated to St. Mirren, this community was founded in the 7th century as a Cluniac monastery, a branch of the Benedictines. There are fantastic windows, both ancient and modern, throughout this restored building. While the origins date back to 1163, this building has constantly been updated and has many lovely sites. The timber ceiling was replaced in 1981 to replace a temporary plaster one from 1788. It's possible the name Paisley comes from the Brythonic word passe leg, meaning basilica. It is believed that William Wallace may have been educated at the Abbey. King Robert II was born there, and possibly through an early caesarean delivery given without anesthesia. Don't miss the twelve angel corbels and stone communion table or the ceiling bosses. Outside are twelve gargoyles, recently replaced along the southwest cloister, including one modeled after the 1979 film Alien. Ross and Cromarty, The Isles Arnold Black House Museum and Girinan Black House Village This outdoor museum in the small village of Arnall on the Isle of Lewis consists of several black houses, traditional crofter cottages, owe their underlying origins in pre-Roman times. Each cottage shows the occupation once widespread in the area. Traditionally, this type of cottage had no chimney, so the smoke from the peat fire found its own way out through the thatch. Often livestock would winter inside the cottages, the family on one end and the animals in a byre on the other end. They provided pungent warmth, and waste funneled through a small drainage ditch through the floor. They are called black houses to contrast them to the later constructed white houses, newer cottages, which were built during the housing projects of the 1800s. At the nearby Girinan Black House Village you can now rent a black house as a self-catering cottage. Bostad Iron Age House On the island of Great Bernera in the Outer Hebrides, this house was revealed after a storm in 1993 and then excavated. They found the remains of a Norse settlement, and under that, five Pictish houses from about 500 CE. The houses have been nicknamed Jelly Baby or Figure 8 houses, due to their shapes. The construction is fascinating, with double layers of dry stone, with gaps filled with sand, clay, turf, midden, and whatever was on hand. 
The original houses have been buried over again to protect them, but a reconstructed house has been erected for visitors. The island is accessible via road bridge from Lewis. It is located on a sheltered beach inlet. Kalanish Stone Circle or Kalanish, dating back to 2900 to 2600 BCE, the Kalanish Stone Circle is probably the most famous stone circle in Scotland. There is a series of several stone circles around the Isle of Lewis, but Kalanish I is the largest and most impressive. It suggested that there were other structures on the site as early as 3000 BCE, but evidence shows the site was abandoned between 2000 to 1700 BCE. The circle is made up of 13 upright stones with a 14th stone in center which marks the entrance to a cairn. Stone rows jutting out from the north, south, east, and west form the shape of an uneven Celtic cross. This circle is larger and older than Stonehenge, with an informative visitor center to explain its history. Kalanish 2, 3, 4, and V are smaller circles nearby, but within sight of Kalanish I, Kalanish IV and V were down to just a few standing stones, and much more difficult to get to. Dun Carlo Way This is an impressive Iron Age tower with double walls. This is one of the most well-preserved brocks in Scotland, with the highest point in the ruin is nearly 30 feet high. The Morrison clan of Ness suggests the site was in use until around 1601 when current occupants of the fort stole cattle from the Macaulays of Uig. In retaliation, as the legend goes, Donald Cam Macaulays used two knives to pull himself up the outer wall, then pushed Heather into the brock, setting it alight. This smoked out the inhabitants, and the brock was summarily destroyed. The site is easily accessible, with a little climb but nothing punishing, and has incredible views of the surrounding area. Its location is fantastic, the land undulated like a disturbed pool. When the sun deems to come out, yellows, golds, oranges, purples, and every other color under the rainbow will appear to jump out at you from the peat bogs and fields. Port NIS, Ness On the northern part of Lewis, the landscape becomes peat bog, a moonscape of undulating brown and gold turf, gently rolling along the top of the land. There are occasional villages along the only road into Ness Village, with white and sandy stucco houses dotted here and there like lonely outposts to a forgotten civilization. There is a harbor with a fantastic view of the northern Atlantic Ocean, and a lighthouse on a 170-foot cliff with more stunning views. In the nearby town of Yeropade, a restored 6th-century church dedicated to St. Moluag. North of the town, a small road takes you to the butt of Lewis Lighthouse, designed and built by David Stevenson in 1862. Its open brick facade makes a striking contrast to the cliffside. Shawbost Norse Mill Also known as the Mill of the Blacksmiths For a fascinating look at a traditional Norse mill, explore the small thatched, rounded buildings in this traditional museum. It operated for several centuries until 1930, though the last of them was still operational until 1945. Restoration work began in the 1960s, but current restoration occurred in 1995. Paths were added shortly thereafter to welcome visitors. There is a kiln, the impressive mill itself, the stream from which the power was gleaned, and the millstones which ground the flour. St. Kilda and Charant Islands both islands are accessible via cruises from the Hebrides and the mainland and are uninhabited by humans, except for some defense personnel and conservation workers in the summers. It is a UNESCO, United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, World Heritage Site for both natural and cultural reasons. There are two types of ancient sheep breeds remaining on the islands, the Soe, Neolithic, and Bore, Iron Age. And while the islands are now uninhabited, there have been people here for at least two millennia, perhaps even four, as there is evidence of stone circles, cairns, and sheepfolds. St. Kilda is the westernmost point of the Outer Hebrides, and the largest island, Herda, boasts the highest sea cliffs in the UK. There is no known saint associated with this island, but it suggested the name Street Kilda is an anglicized version of the Norse, Sunt Kelda, which translates to sweet wellwater.
Charant means holy or enchanted, but whichever it is, these private islands are well named. These are volcanic islands between Sky and Harris, and have the Dolerite columns similar to those in the Giant's Causeway in Ireland and Staffa, part of the Mole Islands. The Charant Islands have large populations of seabirds, including puffins, guillemots, razorbills, fulmers, kittiwakes, and skuas. Ross and Cromarty, Mainland Applecross Road Until the 1970s, the Applecross Road, also known as the Belak Nambo, Pass of the Cattle, was the only road linking Applecross with the rest of the country. This twisting, single-track road reaches a height of 2,054 feet, making it the third-highest road in Scotland, and winds past the Skur of Keorakane. The views are amazing, but be prepared for some precariously steep moments, as well as alpine switchbacks and hairpin bends. Castle Leod This keep is currently the clan seat of Clan Mackenzie, and owned, and occupied, by the current clan chief, the Earl of Cromarty. The castle dates from around the 15th century, though the date 1616 is carved of a dormer window in the extension. This is rather small and compact, but nicely renovated castle. It was very interesting to see the paintings of my forebears on the walls here, and to see the first real ordnance map made of the area by the English after Culloden in 1746 to keep the Scots in check. There is an enormous billiard table in one room, the room had been custom designed to fit it. The Victorian dining room still had panes of the original 17th century glass in it. There are a lot of Jacobite historical items on display, and even a little dungeon. The Earl has a remarkable knowledge of history and family details. My great grandmother was a Mackenzie, so we were eager to explore this place. The Cludy Well. This ancient custom is still in use throughout the British Isles. The term cludy comes from the Scottish clute which means a strip of cloth. Clute is possibly a corruption of the word cloth. Clutey trees are almost always found beside a holy well. To make a wish, a clute is dipped in the well water then tied to the tree while making a wish. It's disputed that if the wish is for healing, that the cloth be used to wash the affected part of the body in the holy water before tying to the tree. As the rag disintegrates, the wish gets sent into the world, or the ailment fades away. Both pagan shrines and holy wells have these traditions. There are many cludy trees and wells all over Scotland, but near Munlochy, there is a forested area with a particularly large cludy well on the south side of the road. In Scotland, the arrival of the Roman Church made holy well pilgrimages illegal, but it still continued in secret. This well is said to date back to circa 620 CE, where pilgrims would come, perform a ceremony by circling the well three times, clockwise, splash some water on the ground and make a prayer. Then they tied their cloth to a nearby tree. There are cludy trees all over Scotland, and indeed, Ireland and England as well. You may also see rosary beads, ribbons, and lengths of colorful yarn, but unfortunately, these days pranksters have been known to hang more than just strips of cloth, such as socks, ties, and even undergarments. Cory Shallot Gorge Found 12 miles southeast of Olapool, this spectacular gorge was formed in the last ice age. There is a Victorian bridge and a platform from which you can see the 150-foot high falls of Misak. It is particularly dramatic after a heavy rain, of course, and the falls usually produce a romantic mist along the gorge. Access is from the A832, on the south side of the gorge. Crossing the bridge might be a challenge if you have a fear of heights, as it is 200 feet high above the gorge. It sways a bit as you walk, but, if you can brave it, on the other side you can get to the viewing platform. Keep following the path west along the trees to reach another viewing platform, which sticks out halfway over the gorge. It is another test of those with a fear of heights, so be warned. Take note that this site closes for repairs without notice. Eagle Stone Also known as Clachentiampane, this stone in Strathpeffer has a very clear carving of an eagle and a horseshoe-like arc symbol. 
Legend says it marks the place of a Scottish clan battle between Clan Monroe and Clan Macdonald in 1411, as the eagle is the symbol of the Monroe clan. The stone is associated with prophesies from the Brain Seer, a 16th century prophet of the Mackenzie clan. He said that if the stone fell three times, the valley would be flooded. It has already fallen twice, but is now anchored in concrete to prevent a third fall. Evidence shows the stone was originally down the hill near Dingwall, but it had been moved for unknown reasons to this location in 1411. Edderton Cross Slab and Clatch by Iraq A Class three Pictish stone, located in the old graveyard in Edderton Village, this cross is made of stunning red sandstone. It has a simple Celtic cross on one side, and on the other side is a horseman with two riders below. This stone has recently been reset in the earth, as it had either sunk into the soil over the centuries, or the soil grew up around it. Either way, you will see a noticeable discoloration. On the other side of Edderton Village is the Edderton Symbol Stone, or Clatch Byarak, a pillar of Bronze Age origin. This stone is nearly 10 feet tall and is a Class I Pictish stone with double disc and salmon carvings. Highland Museum of Childhood Beginning life as a rural Victorian train station in Strathpeffer, this building houses toys and dolls which were originally in the private collection of Mrs. Angela Kelly. She donated the collection to the museum to tell the story of childhood in the Scottish Highlands. There are rocking horses, model yachts, marriage displays, a totem pole, and exhibits explaining various aspects of a child's life in the history of Scotland. Various themes such as birth and baptism, home life, leisure, child labor and education are portrayed, as well as several hands-on activities. Inveru Garden As odd as it sounds, this is a lovely botanical gardens in the highlands of Scotland. Located just north of Polwy on a 2100-acre estate, the gardens themselves cover 49 acres. This garden was established by Osgood Mackenzie in 1862 after the land was gifted to him by his mother. He had originally built Inveru Lodge, but it had been destroyed by fire in 1814 to be rebuilt in 1837 as Inveru House. The garden began with some deer fencing and a dwarf willow in 1862, and now there are over 2,500 exotic plants and flowers, as well as a huge rhododendron collection. A large, curved, walled garden has been reclaimed from the beach, and there are magnificent views across Loch U. The soil was originally acid and scarce, and not suitable for growing anything. However, determination reigned, and Osgood Mackenzie worked his garden, bringing baskets of soil and trees. Over time, he transformed the rocky headland into the lush gardens there today. The estate was handed over to the National Trust for Scotland in 1952 by Osgood's daughter, Mary Sawyer, along with a generous endowment for the garden's upkeep. Polwy While this was once a very important port town, and home to the Red Smitty Iron Works, and a port of entry for cattle coming from Lewis and Harris via the ferry. Today, it is a charming village of white rendered buildings. The rustic St. Malrebo's Church looks medieval but was built in 1965, it was dedicated to the 7th century monk who founded a monastery nearby, and was the first Scottish Episcopal Church to be built in the Northwest Highlands since the Jacobite Revolution. There is also a dramatic war memorial Celtic cross overlooking Loch U. Stack Polyid Anglicized to Stack Poly, this mountain has a rocky crest with pinnacles and gullies. Stack Polyad means peak of the peat moss, and indeed, there is peat moss on the southern side. It is a popular climbing spot, with fine views and easy access via modern road which leads to the large trail to the summit. It can be climbed in less than three hours by a relatively fit climber. If you are looking for a solitary climb, though, you will be disappointed, as the place is quite popular. Because this is such a popular climbing spot, the entire site has suffered from erosion, so take care while visiting. There are some odd formations, such as the Lobster Claw Pinnacle, the Sphinx, the Tam O'Shanter and Andy Cap, to interest the photographers. The views of the Atlantic are incredible. Roxburghshire Jedburgh Abbey 
The borders between Scotland and England have been contentious throughout the centuries, and Jedburgh Abbey is no exception. Established by David I in 1118 CE, the abbey has been subjected to attack and looting, and finally reduced to a parish church in 1560 with the coming of the Reformation. As the church started deteriorating, services moved into a small area of the nave in 1671 for safety reasons. It was finally abandoned in 1871 when a new church was built. By 1917, the site was handed over to Historic Scotland for care. These ruins, while stripped of most decoration, are still beautiful and do retain some interesting features, such as the intricately carved fragment of a shrine that dates back to the 8th century. If you are a fan of delicate and intricate church architecture, this place will certainly not disappoint, with many colonnaded arcades and window casings, rose window, and the Romanesque main doorway. There is a model in the visitor center of how the site may have looked in full repair. Kelso Abbey the grandest of the border abbeys, Kelso was founded during the reign of David I in 1128 by an order of Benedictines called Tyronensians and took more than 75 years to complete. Kelso is a bit different in construction from other abbeys, as the choir and the nave each had a set of north and south transepts, and each had a tower over its crossing. The abbey was badly ruined in the Wars of Independence but was repaired. Later attacks in the 16th century occurred during the period of rough wooing, from which it never recovered. When the Reformation came in 1560, the Tyronentian community was no longer recognized, and by 1587, the church was completely abandoned. Over the years, stones were removed and used to build structures elsewhere in the vicinity. Melrose Abbey there has been a monastery on the site since St. Aidan of Lindisfarne formed one in 650 CE. When the monastery was destroyed by Kenneth MacAlpin in 839 CE, King David I re-established the site in 1136 with monks from Revox Abbey in Yorkshire, at which time, Melrose became the mother church of the order in Scotland. The abbey saw a number of attacks over the centuries but felt the sting of the Reformation. The final blow came during the Cromwellian War of the 1640s, also known as the English Civil War. On this site is a marker where Robert the Bruce's embalmed heart, encased in lead, is buried. What makes this abbey remarkable is that it is reasonably intact, and still quite extensive. Selkirkshire Galatials there are several attractions in this town, including the Harriet Watt University School of Textiles and Design and Galashiels Academy, the Old Gala House, a museum and art gallery with landscaped gardens, the War Memorial with a massive sculpture of a border reaver horseman, and a 90-mile Tweed Cycleway cyclist trail. If you have an interest in Pictish works, there is an earthwork called the Pick's Work Ditch or Cat Rail, extending many miles south. An Iron Age fort and Torwoodley Brock is on the northwest edge of town, though the structure was destroyed by the Romans. Selkirk There has likely been a settlement here since the 6th century, when the local Selgovi tribe converted to Christianity during the time of the Roman Empire's invasions of Caledoniae. Selkirk is the site of the first border abbey, founded by Tyronentian's monks, however they soon moved to Kelso. The town flourished, despite the church's departure, and became known for its trade in textiles, townspeople today are still called suitors, which means cobblers, as Selkirk became a major hub for shoemaking. The improving economy saw a growing wool trade, as well. In spite of modern expansion and industry, the town center still retains its original medieval plan. As the town expanded, it saw its share of history, including a royal castle erecting in 1301, known as Selkirk Peel. The church at Selkirk is where William Wallace was declared guardian of the Kingdom of Scotland, and in 1799, Sir Walter Scott was appointed sheriff deputy of the county of Selkirk, which was based in the Royal Burgh's Courthouse, now a museum. If you are lucky enough to visit during the second Friday after the first Monday in June, you can witness one of the oldest ceremonies in the area. As many as 400 riders participate in a cavalcade of the Selkirk Common Riding, running along the northern boundaries of the land. There is a week-long celebration around the event, including picnics, races, and festivals. Yarrow Stone 
Also known as the Liberalis Stone, it stands beside the track leading to Whitefield and just west of Yarrow. The stone has an early Christian inscription in Latin memorializing two British princes, Nudos and Dumnogenus, who lived in the 5th and 6th centuries, which reads, This is the everlasting memorial. In this place lie the most famous princes Nudos and Dumnogenus. In this tomb lie the two sons of Liberalis. The stone was discovered lying flat over some human remains. There were twenty cairns in the area, so it's a good area to explore if you've an interest in ancient burials or holy sites. Shetland Brock of Clickamon slash Musa Brock A well-preserved brock on Shetland, this Pictish round structure stands on Clickamon Lock and is connected to the mainland with a stone causeway. One unusual feature is a stone slab with two sculptured footprints in the causeway. It was thought that footprints of that sort, like the one in Dunad and Argyle, are associated with kingship. You can explore the small Bronze Age farmhouse, the cattle enclosure, and the surrounding building foundations. This site was first occupied 3,000 years ago, and the original settlement still has remains. The tower itself is also called Musa Brock, and once stood about 16 yards high. There are some 500 brocks in Scotland, and the Bach of Musa is probably the most well-preserved brock of them all, however Clickamon is more accessible. Byer Chapel The church that doesn't look like a church. This byer, cow sheet or barn, has been converted into a small chapel, while retaining its original features. The interior is simple and beautiful, with hay bales, wooden pews and cross, and a simple concrete floor decorated with a crisscross pattern. The pews are covered with sheepskins for comfort. It was originally the chapel of the Society of Our Lady of the Isles, a convent that has now been moved to a purpose-built chapel nearby. Fair Isle By definition, this is a hidden place. It is the most remote inhabited island in the UK, and measures three by one and a half miles. It is the southernmost island of the Shetland Islands, and it is halfway to the Orkney Group. Fair Isle is most known for the Bird Observatory, and for its traditional style of knitting. This place has been inhabited since the Bronze Age, with a current occupancy of 68, as of the 2013 census, who live on crofts in the south. You can observe workers while they build boats, spin, weave, or knit. While there are no pubs or restaurants on the island, there is a permanent bird observatory founded by George Waterston in 1948 and provides catered accommodation rather than hostelry. Jarlshof This is the best-known prehistoric archaeological site on Shetland, located near the southern tip of the main island, dating from 2500 BC through the 17th century. The Bronze Age settlers built several oval houses that are mostly underground, but excavated, as well as a smithy, Iron Age settlers created a brock and defensive walls, Picts added several works of art, wheelhouses, and a symbol stone, Viking ruins include a longhouse and a medieval farmhouse. You will see several layers of civilization in this one place. Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, Pictish, Norse, and medieval artifacts and buildings are on location, and each one offers a different glimpse into the past. If you normally skip over the explaining exhibit signs to just enjoy the actual artifacts, you may miss some of the wonder and awe the site has to offer, so take some time to learn about what you are seeing first. Stirlingshire Balquitter Founded by St. Angus in the 8th or 9th century, it is known as a magical place, called a thin place by the Celts, where the place between heaven and earth meets. St. Angus blessed the glen at the house Bannock Ein Geese, Blessing of Angus, is now located, and there is a small stone oratory at Kirkton, where he lived. Balquitter village has lovely mountain terrain and is home to the McGregor clan. 18th century folk hero and outlaw, Robert Ray McGregor, known more familiarly as Rob Roy, lived and died here. The ruins of the small cottage where he lived while under the protection of John Campbell, 2nd Duke of Argyll, can be found in Glenshira. His remains, along with those of his wife and son, can be found in the Balquitter graveyard. Bar Hill Roman Fort and Antonine Wall 
Built circa 143 CE, this small ruin is what remains of the highest fort on the Antonine Wall, the secondary largest boundary past Hadrian's Wall. There is a small Iron Age fort to the east, and the wall ditch runs past both. It is one of two places to get the best view of the wall and its surrounding area and includes baths as well the fort. The wall was 37 miles long and cut the country in half, dividing the highlands from the lowlands, but it was only in use for about 20 years. Rough Castle is the other good spot to explore the wall and is just two miles west of Falkirk. This castle is the smallest of the 19 fortlets built along the wall and the best preserved. Dune Castle This site had probably been a fort in Roman times, but the castle itself was originally built in the 13th century by the Stuart family and has been used since as a hunting lodge, dower house, and royal retreat. It was used as a prison and garrison in the 17th and 18th centuries after the Earls of Moray, the Stuarts, took possession in the 16th century. While much of it is a ruin, the castle is in remarkable shape, and many rooms have been fully restored to allow visitors. The hall is vaulted and, unusually, features double fireplaces. Take some time to see the Lord's Tower, the Great Hall and Kitchen Tower, Courtyard and Curtain Walls, and enjoy the stunning scenery. Falkirk Wheel the world's only rotating boat lift, this fascinating engineering feat is worth a look, even if you aren't a transport or engineering enthusiast. There is a particular elegance to this odd structure. Opened in 2002, it connects the Forth and Clyde Canal with the Union Canal. It replaces 11 locks and is quite spectacular and a little surreal to see in operation. Inspirations for the design include the double-headed Celtic axe, a ship's propeller, and even a whale's ribcage. Kelpie Sculpture Just completed in September 2013, these two massive sculptures are 98 feet high and situated above the Forth and Clyde Canal, forming a dramatic gateway. Designed by sculptor Andy Scott, the Kelpies, Water Horses, or Ikishka, are a monument to the heritage of horse-powered industry across central Scotland. They are definitely impressive sculptures, and in the right light, they reflect on the water of the canal, making for a fantastic photo opportunity. The legend of the Kelpie is listed in the history and myths section of this book. Mura von Side Graveyard the high percentage of elaborately carved gravestones in this 18th century graveyard are mostly due to one stonemason, who evidently enjoyed his work very much. The carvings along the edges of the stones include skulls, heads, angels and mortals, crossed bones, hourglasses, castles, trumpet motifs, and more. The details are amazing, intricate, and worth a long visit to explore all the unusual art, especially as gravestones typically are left to decay over time. These are in remarkably well-preserved states. Sutherland Ardvrak Castle Looking like a stone hand coming up out of the land, this lonely, ruined castle on Loch Ascent, along the northern coast of Scotland, dates from the 16th century, though the MacLeods owned surrounding lands since the 13th century. MacLeod ownership was short-lived, however, as it was captured by the Mackenzie clan in 1672, who also took control of the surrounding lands. The Mackenzies built the nearby Calda House in 1726, but it burned down in 1737 under mysterious circumstances and remains in ruin today. The castle is deceptively small, but was originally a large, imposing structure which included a walled garden. There is also a vaulted cellar below. Only the ground floor is accessible, but be mindful, as the lock is tidal and will quickly flood the causeway to the island. The castle is said to be haunted by two ghosts. One is a tall man dressed in grey and may be the Marquis of Montrose. The other ghost is a young girl, who had been betrothed to a Mackenzie as payment to build the castle. She despaired and threw herself off the tower. There is also a mermaid or sulky legend associated with the lock. And visitors have frequently claimed to see strange lights from the castle, while others at the castle have claimed seeing what looked like car headlights at dusk and waited, but no car appeared. Balin Orr 
Derived from the Norse word Jalmundal, meaning Dale of the Hamlet, the town of Helmsdale gained its biggest notoriety from the Great Sutherland Gold Rush of 1868. Two tributaries of River Helmsdale saw the greatest success during the Gold Rush, at the Suiskill and Kildonan Burns. Who doesn't want to go find gold? There is a small information center on Suiskill Estate, where you can sign up to go gold panning, though don't expect to strike it rich, camp free of charge, or just enjoy the surrounding beauty of the highlands. Clack Toll Brock Though heavily ruined, this brock still boasts the double wall construction common with this type of fort, as well as the stairway running up through the space between the walls. It has a huge triangular lintel stone above its doorway, as well as lintels on the cells and wall chambers. It is considered one of the most spectacular Iron Age settlements in the northwest area of Scotland. It sits on a rocky outcrop on the Bay of Clactoll, with views across the bay to the village of Stor. As you approach, it doesn't look like much, perhaps just a tumble pile of rocks, but as you round the front, it forms an organized structure. Dunrobin Castle, Gardens, and Museum If you think this castle looks like it belongs in a fairy tale, you'd be right. Originally dating from the 1300s, it has been rebuilt and added onto several times over the centuries. It has turrets and towers, sweeping staircases, and manicured gardens, which were inspired by the palace at Versailles. Overlooking the waters of Dornoch Firth, you will see the formal gardens from the balconies, and the sea lies just beyond. It is a glittering sight to behold. You can also watch a falconry demonstration if you get there at the right time. It is definitely worth a tour, as the rooms are all beautifully preserved. One is full of period clothing, ball gowns, and uniforms. Portraits adorn many walls. Needlework from the fifth duke's wife is in the paneled dining room. And the library boasts more than 10,000 books. The museum is full of trophy heads from many animals shot by family members while on safari, as well as displays of archaeological artifacts discovered on the estate. Sandwood Bay Having been called the most magnificent beach in the UK, it is an isolated, picturesque mile-long beach that lies to the south of Durness and Cape Wrath. Sandwood probably gets its name from the Norse word sandvatn, meaning sand water. It's believed Norse longships were dragged across the dunes here to Sandwood Lock. Today, you will find a mile and a half of pinkish sand and huge sand dunes. Sea cliffs and an impressive sea stack face right into the fierce North Atlantic Ocean. It is not easy to get to, but that is part of why it is so unspoiled. There is a public road a few miles northwest of Kinlich Burvey. The walk is about four miles long and isn't the most interesting stroll, but the result is worth it. There is peat bog on either side, so don't stray from the path. There are several legends of this remote beach, including the sighting of a yellow-tailed mermaid and the ghost of a mariner, victim of a shipwreck off the coast, said to knock on the windows of the old cottage near the beach when it was still inhabited. This stretch of coastline has been host to numerous shipwrecks over the centuries, all of which lay out at sea, or indeed under the sand. West Lothian Almond Castle Approach this ruined castle with care, as the walls are not maintained and can crumble. It would be much safer to view from the outside. Also called the Haining and Haining Castle, this structure likely dates back to the early 15th century. It passed into the Livingston family in 1542 by way of marriage and underwent some expansion in later decades. After several generations, the current lord, Sir James Livingston, was given the title of Lord Almond, after which the castle adopted the name Almond. It has been a ruin since this lord backed the Jacobite movement and had his lands forfeited to the crown. Perhaps one day this lovely ruin will be restored, carefully. Blackness Castle This 15th-century fortress has an odd, defensive shape which follows the contours of the rocky coastline of the shore of the Firth of Forth. Originally built in the mid-15th century by Sir George Crichton, this castle served as the main port serving the royal burg of Linlithgow. The lands and titles were forfeited to the crown at the time of King James II of Scotland, and it has remained in crown hands ever since. 
it has been a state prison, garrison, and ammunition depot. In the mid-16th century, the castle was one of the most advanced artillery fortifications in Scotland at the time. Still, it fell to Cromwell's army in 1650. It was briefly occupied during World War I but has largely been abandoned ever since. It is now in the care of historic Scotland. It's been called the ship that never sailed, due to its odd shape and position on the fourth. Five Sisters Zoo You've been tramping around churches and castles, so you need a place to take the kids and run off some pent-up energy. This rescue and rehabilitation center is a great place to take the kids for a day out. There are animals, birds, and reptiles from all over the world. You can even become a zookeeper for a half or full day, or a half day for kids 6 to 16 where the day's chores include cleaning pens, feeding the animals, learning to handle the various species. At the end of the day, your child receives a certificate of zookeeping and a gift. Other activities include a play castle and pirate ship area. If you get hungry, there is the Brown Bear Cafe for some sandwiches or soups or box lunches for the kids. Linlithgow Palace This palace is an imposing structure on a picturesque loch, a fantastic place to see a magnificent great hall, fountains, angel musician sculptures, and beautiful, elegant windows. The palace was a principal royal residence for Scottish monarchs of the 15th and 16th centuries. The last major event that took place there was when Bonnie Prince Charlie visited in September 1745, when the fountains were said to have flowed with wine. For short months later, the castle saw its destruction by the army of the Duke of Cumberland in 1746. It has since been partially restored and is now open to the public. It is said to be haunted by the ghost of Mary of Guise, mother of Mary, Queen of Scots. Wigtownshire Barcelog Fort This 2,000-year-old fortified farmstead has never been excavated, but was likely lived in by a tribe the Romans called the Novanti. It is on the edge of a sea cliff, with views of the Isle of Man, Northern Ireland, and the Mole of Galloway. There are earthen ramparts and probably contained at least two large roundhouses, possibly four, and irregular in shape. Great for rambling exploration, as you imagine the possibilities. Drumtrodden Stones This is really two sites, one is an alignment of three stones, one fallen, and the other is a set of rocks marked with cup and ring carvings. They are located between Port William and Whithorn. The first site dates to circa 2000 BCE, with stones about 10 feet tall. The nearby cup and ring stones are reached through a farmstead and were probably carved during the Bronze Age. It's possible that they were aligned with the midsummer sunrise in the northwest and the midwinter sunset in the southwest. They are on a large open plateau, surrounded by a small stone wall, offering safety and isolation. Logan Botanic Garden because the southwest tip of Scotland has a mild climate, there are many trees and plants that wouldn't normally survive outdoors in Scotland. It has a woodland garden, a walled garden, a water garden, and a terrace garden with chusan palms. Walk along the pond within the walled garden, explore what little remains of Castle Balsyland, and stroll through the 50 varieties of eucalyptus. It is open April through September. Conclusion I do hope you enjoyed your journey through the lowlands, highlands, and islands of Scotland. The land is so enriched by history, legend, and myth, a stunning jewel on the crown of Europe. There is a passion of place and of people in this land, one that is strong and deep, though sometimes austere and silent as well. It is manifest in the manner of the people, the strength of the hills, and the beauty in the art and architecture. If you travel anywhere, it helps, I believe, to have some sense of history, some knowledge of the myths and beliefs of the land. I believe this increases the magic the land reflects into the true traveler. Whether you are visiting to enjoy the beautiful gardens, the charming pubs, the hidden magic places, the stunning architecture, or the megalithic monuments of Scotland, you will not be disappointed. It is a place to hold dear, a place to make memories to treasure and relish, a stunning place of magic and mystery.
yearning to delve into the mysteries of the Emerald Isle? Skip the tourist traps and unearth new ways to delight in its legendary landscape. Ireland, mythical, magical, mystical, a guide to hidden Ireland is an eye-opening travel guidebook. If you like escaping the beaten path, a conversational approach, and creating lasting memories, then you'll love Christy Nicholas's invaluable resource. Start reading Ireland, Mythical, Magical, Mystical, A Guide to Hidden Ireland Now. When the magical secrets of the Emerald all beckon, will she survive answering the call? Legacy of Hunger is the sweeping first book in the Druid's Brooch historical fantasy series. If you like compelling female characters, immersive authenticity, and a dash of magic, then you'll love Christy Nicholas's transatlantic quest. Start reading Legacy of Hunger to trace a family treasure today. Thank you! Thank you so much for enjoying this guide. If you've enjoyed the story, please consider leaving a review so other readers can discover Scotland's hidden treasures. If you would like to get updates, sneak previews, sales, and contests, please sign up for my newsletter. And see all the books available through Green Dragon Publishing at www.greendragonartist.com Website Resources General Scotland Information Green Dragon Artist www.greendragonartist.com My own website dedicated to travel in the UK Undiscovered Scotland www.undiscoveredscotland.co.uk Fantastic interactive map and information resource Scotland www.scotland.org, a great resource for all things Scottish. Mythical, mystical, historical, or hidden places. Celtic Myth Pods How, podcasts.apple.com, dramatizations of Celtic myths. Orkney Jar, www.orkneyjar.com, the heritage of the Orkney Islands. Powerful Places, www.powerfulplaces.com, a great set of books and a blog for spiritual places in the British Isles. Sacred Texts, www.sacredtexts.com, a guide to tales from William Yeats, Lady Gregory, and many others. Stone Pages, www.stonepages.com, a guide to stone circles and standing stones. Thin Place, www.thinplace.net, a guide to spiritual places. UNESCO World Heritage Center, whc.unesco.org, listing of world heritage sites. Travel-related sites. Auto Europe, www.autoeurope.com, car rental. Enterprise Car Rental, www.enterprise.com. Expedia, www.expedia.com Fodor's Forums, www.fodors.com Great help, and some snarky advice from others who have been there. Google Maps, maps.google.com Green Traveler, www.greentraveler.co.uk For those that prefer low-carbon holidays. Ensure My Trip, www.insuremetrip.com to compare travel insurance plans. ITA Software Matrix, matrix.itasoftware.com, fairly comprehensive airfare search. Listed properties of the UK, www.list.co.uk. Scotrail, www.scotrail.co.uk. Scottish Pubs, www.insiderscotlandguide.com Seat Guru, www.seatguru.com Find out which seats are best. Slow Travel, www.smartertravel.com For those who wish to travel at a slower pace. Traditional Music and Song, www.tmsa.org.uk TripAdvisor, www.tripadvisor.com for researching the BNBS, hotels, and sites. Via Michelin, www.viamichelin.com, great for planning routes and times. Unusual places to stay, www.quirkyacom.com. Discount sources. 
Airfare Watchdog, www.airfarewatchdog.com, for discount airfare. Better Bidding, www.betterbidding.com, for using hotwire slash priceline bidding. Bidding for Travel Bidding for Travel.yuku.com, for using hotwire slash priceline bidding. Edinburgh Pass, www.edinburgh.org. Flyer Talk, www.flyertalk.com, for those who travel frequently. Historic Scotland Pass, www.historicscotland.gov.uk. Kayak, www.kayak.com. Last Minute Travel, www.lastminutatravel.com, for last minute airfare deals. Lonely Planet, www.lonelyplanet.com, good all round site, especially for tight budgets. National Heritage Membership, www.britainexpress.com. STA Travel, www.statravel.com, for student and teacher travel. Student Universe, www.studentuniverse.com, for student and teacher travel. Travel Zoo, www.travelzoo.com, for discount airfare. Veterans Advantage, www.veteransadvantage.com, for veteran travel. Photography Sources DP Review, www.preview.com, to compare cameras. Lulu, www.lulu.com, for book and calendar printing. Simply Canvas, www.simplycanvas.com, for photographic printing. White House Custom Copies, www.whcc.com, for photographic printing. Print Resources Ashmore, PJ, Neolithic and Bronze Age Scotland, an authoritative and lively account of an enigmatic period of Scottish prehistory, Batsford, 2003. Campbell, John Gregor Son, The Gaelic Otherworld, Berlin, Limited, 2012. Herman, A., How the Scots Invented the Modern World, Crown Publishing Group, 2001. Hunter, James, Last of the Free, A History of the Highlands and Islands of Scotland, Mainstream Publishing, 2000. MacDonald, Charles, Moited Among the Clan Reynolds, Berlin, Limited, 2011. MacDonald, Donald, Tales and Traditions of the Loos, Berlin, Limited, 2000. Mackey, J.D., A History of Scotland, Pelican, 1964. Marwick, Ernest, The Folklore of Orkney and Shetland, Berlin, Limited, 1975. Matthews, John. Celtic Myths and Legends, Pitkin Guides, 2001. McNeil, F. Marion, The Silver Bow, Canongate, 2001. Patterson, Raymond Campbell, The Lord of the Isles, A History of Clan Donald, Berlin, Limited, 2008. Prior, F. Britain B.C., Life in Britain and Ireland Before the Romans, Harper Collins, 2003. Scott, Ronald McNair, Robert the Bruce, King of Scots, Canongate, 1996. Sto Stett, Marie Louise. Gods and Heroes of the Celts. London, 1949. Translation by Miles Dillon of Sto Stett's De E.T. Heroes de Celts. Paris, 1940. Stuart, R.J. Celtic Gods, Celtic Goddesses. Blandford Press, 1992. Stuart, R.J. Celtic Myths, Celtic Legends. Blandford Press, 1996. Sykes, Brian, Saxons, Vikings and Celts, The Genetic Roots of Britain and Ireland, W. W. Norton and Company, 2007. Dedication. I would like to dedicate this book to my parents, D. Paul and Judy. My love of art and travel, as well as my sense of determination comes directly from them, and I love them deeply for it. I would also like to thank my supportive husband, Jason, without whom I would be lost and adrift. About the author. 
Christy Nicholas writes under several pen names, including Rowan Dillon, C.N. Jackson, and Emmeline Reese. She's an author, artist, and accountant. After she failed to become an airline pilot, she quit her ceaseless pursuit of careers that begin with the letter A and decided to concentrate on her writing. Since she has project completion compulsion, she is one of the few authors with no unfinished novels. Christie has her hands in many crafts, including digital art, beaded jewelry, writing, and photography. In real life, she's a CPA, but having grown up with art all around her, her mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother are slash were all artists, it sort of infected her, as it were. She wants to expose the incredible beauty in this world, hidden beneath the everyday grime of familiarity and habit, and share it with others. She uses characters out of time and places infused with magic and myth, writing magical realism stories in both historical fantasy and time travel flavors. Social Media Links Blog www.greendragonartist.net Website www.greendragonartist.com Facebook www.facebook.com Instagram www.instagram.com TikTok www.tiktok.com